this is really, I mean, in, this is just the most exciting thing to have come through this entire semester, and now the culminating event is you guys. And it's just so exciting for all of us to have the opportunity to hear all of, so many of you, and I hope to be hearing more of you in the future. Um, yes? I'll give it a round of applause for Susie for curating this amazing. <laughs> So Michelle Whitaker asked me to uh, remind you guys about the Southampton MFA blog, which is uh, southamptonmfa.wordpress.com. See Michelle if you'd like to contribute, and we're going to be posting a link to the MFA blog on the Writer Speak Wednesday site, either tonight or tomorrow morning, so you'll be able to access it through that link as well. Um, we're going to just get moving. Uh, I guess you know who every, you all know who each other is, but our first reader is Emily Logan. So let's welcome him. Hi, I'm Emily Logan. I'll be reading from the first few pages of my novella, which I started in Roger Rosenblatt's class last year, and it's called Paper. She brushed her teeth, turned on the shower until steamy ghosts invaded the bathroom, and sang Alleluia all the way through, until she toweled off and dabbed on some makeup. Then she walked out the door and died, meteor to the face. I felt it when it happened. I just knew. I was making pancakes, and an unpleasant pang went through my chest, and a piece of me drifted away forever. Before I could think to put the spatula down, I ran outside to try to catch whatever was floating away from me, to try to save it. But it was already gone. I stood outside, just thinking, as batter dripped down the spatula and onto the stoop. I made her. The funny thing is I cried. It's funny because you don't think you can cry for someone who never even existed until you're standing there in a puddle of liquid pancakes, tears flooding your eyes. You feel like the whole world folded into itself and rolled into some cosmic trash can. Except it's not the whole world. It's just the world that you made, along with her. I made her in my basement, with a pen in hand and a piece of lined paper, I was there from the start as I scratched her out onto the page. She was born to a single mother who was alone in her car when she started to feel the contractions quick in their pace. From there, I watched from a distance and knew everything about her all the way through, start to finish. I loved her, and she didn't love me back. But that's how all my relationships are anyway. I was used to it, and it even gave me some sort of comfort to know I didn't have to expect her to return my feelings. I gave her a home, educated her in a nice elementary school. Perhaps it wasn't fair of me to give her classmates that picked on her because she had glasses and a single mom. And the single mom thing, maybe that wasn't very nice of me either, but when you're in your basement and it's hours past midnight, you start thinking of tragedies that you just couldn't come up with in the middle of the day. Tragedies like a father to be dying in a bus accident only a few weeks before her do his daughter was supposed to be born. And then, just around four in the morning, the coffee started losing its magical effect, and I tripped up the stairs to bed. When I woke up, something awful happened. I forgot all about her in my basement. The thing about non-existent people is that they can't tell you what's wrong. They can't bang on the basement door to let you know they're being neglected. They can't yell up the stairs to remind you they can't go anywhere without your help. So, I forgot. The next morning, I woke up late for work. I rushed through my morning routine and walked right past the silent basement door. The whole time she was downstairs, directly beneath the hurried pattering of my feet as I got ready to go. When I pulled into the parking lot 20 minutes after 9, I thought my boss might ream me. But he was in a meeting, so I was safe. I wasn't really sure what I did at my job. My desk said marketing team member, but I think I was really hired as a secretary without them telling me. Every day the phone rang, and on the other side of the line was someone who really didn't need me at all. I'd tell them I'd transfer their call to someone who could help and 90% of the time I accidentally hung up on them before transferring. They almost never called back. The days were dull and boring, and my boss never gave me direct answers on what I needed to do. I would have taken initiative on a project that my teammates and I were help working on, but the problem was there was never any projects, and there were never any team. <laughs> I worked in my own office at the end of the long, dark hallway. No one except the people on the phone ever bothered me, so I wrote. I think when I started writing on that day, I'd remember there was someone in my basement I'd already started to build, but I didn't. 
As I drove home, the clouds were greeting each other and getting real close as rain started to spray the road. The knob to my front door was wet and slippery, and the dirty water I tracked in didn't dry up until hours later. Sky was grumbling about something, letting out little frustrated shocks of lightning here and there. I blew into my tea, and my nose drank in the hot wisps of steam. I sat staring at the wall for a while, thinking about nothing. When a loud crack sounded and the lights went out, I remained sitting with my tea for a few moments before doing anything about it. The flashlight was dusty and easy to find in a cabinet that wasn't filled with too many things. I flicked it on and tried to remember what people normally do when the power goes out. Lanterns, emergency candles, something about circuit breakers, all of them downstairs. I waited an hour, but the lights were still out. While I normally would avoid at all costs going down alone into a dark basement, I figured it was necessary now. So I clutched the flashlight and opened the basement door to make my way slowly down the wooden stairs. The flashlight was losing life quickly, and I had to twist my face to see better in the dimness. <clears throat> there were stacks of boxes along each of the walls, and in not the faintest clue which one might hold the necessary emergency equipment. Lightning kept flashing, and I could see it through the tiny windows at the top of the basement walls. I edged a little closer to a stack of boxes when a longer series of lightning flashes revealed something white sitting at the desk in the middle of the room. Thank you. And next, Dave Leslie. Hello. <laughs> So I'm going to read two poems that I wrote in Julie's class. Okay. Said the serfs to their lord, that in spite you hasten the end to pierce and sew and bend. The apples have said their peace. Chain our wrists for free. For the cage will not repent, and your leader will gladly rent our wounds for wine and meat. Chain our wrists for free. We honor the land of lead, not you with eyes of red. We speak of you with ivy. Chain our wrists for free. Glory be your neglect, for the rusted metal wrecks the pit. To dig to live, chain our wrists for free. And second poem. I look through spotted glass. You don't see the oatmeal in my cup as I relish each bare step. I'll show you the rocks on the roof, the hollows in the sky, the checkerboard turning over and over again. I've been to the slope in your house, the swallows of your mouth. You still won't see me through the glass, telling you six different times to listen to the rush of the crickets and the folds of my hat. But you know of the fathers who left, the daughters who crept. No, you know too much. do two quick stories, actually, uh, the first of which is told by a very angry semicolon, um, and the second of which is about an uh, interesting event at the dinner table. So the first is by the semicolon, and it's called, Don't You Wink at Me. <laughs> All I've ever wanted to do is make things clearer, easier for people to understand, and I don't think it's unreasonable to want to be used correctly, though it's getting harder and harder to remember a time when I actually was. It seems ages, though I suppose that might be a bit drastic, since just one age represents over 2,000 years, which, I have to admit, is even older than I am. But semantics doesn't excuse centuries of abject neglect of not only my proper application, but of my very existence, misuse in such a wide array of circumstances as to surpass the possibility of being merely impolite or even plain old rude, verging instead on pure insolence and most recently, exploitation at the hands of sweaty teenagers jabbing away with their fat fingers on those tiny little keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> jabbing away with their kind of in vain, <laughs> hormone-ridden attempts to impress Judy or Johnny with their clearly overrated and underdeveloped senses of wit. 
Punctuation Children was designed for the clear expression of ideas, for the clarity of purpose, not for winking, which I'm sure I don't have to explain since this generation, while seemingly unable or at least unwilling to take the time to understand my actual purpose, has no problem, no problem remembering eight different shorthand, and I use that term lightly, ways to express their apparent overabundance of mirth. Laughter that I can't help but feel somehow directed at me, or at least that's the impression I get every time I'm slammed up against the parentheses. <laughs> Half of a flighty construction that has long been stealing opportunities from me, an indignity made all the more unbearable since those pimpled and paunchy excuses of flesh likely know as little about the correct use of a parenthetical as they do about me. However, <laughs> I am not willing to excuse such treatment simply because of ignorance or poor education, both of which are ex excuses themselves, examples of the laziness that has permeated not only the youth of the society, but society as a whole, and its unwillingness to abide by or even learn the traditions and rules on which it was founded. So, if you think I'm being unreasonable, you can take an exclamation point and shove it up your ass. <laughs> next one is called Spoon by Spoon. There was rice pilaf on my plate. This was a problem. Everyone was eating it, happily even, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. My brother munched away next to me, smiling and getting presents, while I sat there and stared at the pilaf mushed up against the baked beans. The lines were blurring, the walls between them crumbling, and I could feel my body rebelling. My stomach shut down the acid plant, my mouth turned off the salivary sprinklers, and my teeth locked the place up tight. It just wasn't happening. I loved rice. Could eat it by the spoonful, but this, this wasn't rice. It had been sullied. I didn't even know what a pilaf was, but I hated them. I hated them so much. They looked like little worms, tanned maggots, and I could just picture them crawling around in the pot, poking their heads in, out, and around, yellowing the rice, killing it, and then their work done, willfully succumbing to the steam before taking their place on my plate. These crimes would not go unpunished. Something had to be done. It would have to be quick. <laughs> there were too many people around, too many witnesses, and any kind of commotion would alert my mother. With baked beans and rice pilaf on my plate, she'd already be on guard. <laughs> Stupid graduation party. Sixth grade, wow. Congratulations, Teddy, you can add. <laughs> there had to be a way out of this, a loophole. The garbage in the kitchen was out of the question, too public. She'd see it and she'd know. <laughs> but taking my plate to any other place would attract too much attention. Pockets might have worked if I'd, if I'd been wearing jeans, but with those stupid khakis she'd made me wear, the juice would leak right through. She'd thought of everything. <laughs> Nothing ever remained hidden. I squished my way to the bathroom, peel off under the left, beans under the right. I could, I could feel them mushing with each step, squeezing between my toes and oozing around the sides. I thought it would be fun, but I just felt nauseous, and all I could really think about was how much easier it all was when Dad was still here, and how he'd have reached over and eaten it, spoon by spoon, when Mom had her back turned. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Ryan Tamilari. play Life is Not a Couch, but sometimes we need to sit. Um, we have the narrator, we have Angela, Phil, Jimmy, Nicole, and Kevin. Um, and I apologize if it's a little raunchy. Uh, <laughs> Phil's wandered to the local bar after leaving Tim and Adams. He's already a little drunk and trying real hard to make friends. So, you a Packers fan? Nope. Oh, so you're from Raider Nation then, huh? The what? Raider Nation, baby. Sliver and Black. I'll give you credit. Your running back is a hell of a talent, but he's got nothing on my boy Rogers. This is a quarterback-driven league, honey. Get with it or get out. You know what I'm saying? Excuse me. I'm here to meet a friend. Oh, so no football for you. Huh. Who's the friend? She hot? I bet she's hot. Girls like you don't hang around with ugly chicks. <laughs> what does that mean? Listen, I know the deal. Certain numbers hang with certain numbers. It's simple math. Like you. You're a solid six. Excuse me? No, you wouldn't be caught dead hanging out with a four or three. <coughs> what would that do for you, besides making you look like the hottest ugly chick? Now, no one wants that. 
But you, you hang with like an eight or a nine, well, then you're the most gettable hot chick, and everyone loves that. Angela gets up and smacks Bill. She walks down to the other half of the bar. That was a compliment, whore. That gets another? Yeah, but get her drunk first. These sober shirts are just too stiff. Hey, girl, dumbass. I'll get you another drink. Oh, yeah. yeah. Jimmy goes behind the counter to get Bill his drink. Hey, hey, Jimmy. Jimmy, I got a question. Shoot. Would you say that girl's a six? That lady that slapped you? Yeah. Give her an eight. An eight? Whoa. Whoa, buddy. Easy does it. She has the ass of an eight. But, yeah, everything else is kind of lacking. Well, what can I say? I'm a sucker for a nice ass. Hmm. Interesting. So you're an ass guy. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I am too. I mean, Sarah had an awesome body. Her tits weren't too big, you know, like an athletic size. The kind you could splash in but not swim. She was tight all over. Really took care of her body. But yeah, I definitely like the, her ass the best. God, the way it swayed back and forth, side to side. Jimmy walks away while Phil continues. It was just confident. A confident ass. Like it knew what it was doing. It knew it controlled you. And man, the boy shorts. You ever see a nice ass in a nice pair of boy shorts? It makes you want to eat it. All up. Not big bites, but like nice nibbles. Phil notices Jimmy is no longer there. Where'd he go? He's like a ninja. Kevin walks into the bar. He sees Phil and approaches. Hey, Phil, you here by yourself? You don't see anyone else, do you? No, I guess not. You ready for the game? It's gonna be a tough win, but... Tough win my ass. Packers fucking rock. Raiders suck my balls. If you don't think the Packers will win, then what kind of fan are you, huh? Kevin walks away from Phil. Good, walk away, you sorry excuse for a cheese head. <laughs> An attractive young woman now enters the bar. Her name is Nicole. Don't notice it. God damn, what's your name? Nicole. You're Angela's friend, right? Yeah, actually I am. How did you know? Well, see, I noticed you were about a nine, and Angela's like a six. So it only makes sense that you would be your friend. I tried to tell the bitch, but she walked off. I think your friend's a whore. I, I don't know if you should sit back and sit back. I'd say you should ditch her. I love the Packers. We can watch the game up here. Nicole walks over disgusted. Jimmy approaches. Listen, Phil, you either gotta shut up or leave. I can't have you harassing everyone in here. Hit me again, Mr. Bartender. I want another. You're done for today, pal. Hey, I'll tell you what I'm done. Nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> Come on, Phil, this is embarrassing. Don't you usually just watch the game with Adam and Tim? Go over there. It'll be better off for you. No, they're having sex with Coldplay. I don't even listen to them. Why would I fuck them? Coldplay? Yeah, you know the band with like the guitar guy and he walks backwards and shit. You know, when the power show was like a singer and they like dance and sing. <laughs> Phil, go home. You gotta go home. Oh, what? I mentioned sex and you want me to go now? No, I wanted you to go an hour ago. <laughs> That'd be nice. Just get the hell out of here. Ah, oh, I see. You're jealous. You want to fuck Coldplay too. Well, guess what? 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 Do you like Coldplay? You think they're cool? Jesus, just get out of here. I think I'm gonna listen to them. Maybe they are good. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, I feel you. Just go get some rest. Thanks, Jimmy. You know you're like my best friend. No one else listens to me the way you do. And gives me great advice. And feeds me beer. You're awesome. I love you, man. You teach me the ways of life. You're like Yoda. Like an awesome green little Jedi master. Um, good night, Phil. I'll push you away from the bar. Love you very much, I do. <laughs> <laughs> entitled Following Horses with Plows. Elementary Science. God shrunk the dinosaurs into chickens so that they fit in Noah's Ark, she declared. How had I not noticed this simple fact, the blue-gray smooth of reptile on their legs, the slowly curling talons, dangerous in disguise, 
Do they miss their old selves, I wonder, all long leathered bodies and tails, or prefer themselves dwarfed, all feathers, shielded from 40 days rain? <coughs> following horses with plows. Dreams are not Percherons. They are not even religions or Twitter pages, but burdens. For I am fighting through head-high grasses, bare toes turning over little earth, my dreams yoked in tow. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Joe Burrow. Hi everyone. This is a new story. Um, <laughs> it's called The Hole. I never knew how seriously Paul had been considering it. But I never knew very much about Paul. That's what I like to begin with. He was the first friend I made in town. And each night we walked home, I would watch him ease his way up the porch steps, slip inside his house before the lamp in his bedroom would come on, and set the room aglow. I hardly ever saw any other lights coming from inside the house, although there was always a television shining through the curtains of a bedroom on the second floor. I never thought to ask Paul who that was, or why he never went upstairs to say hello. I was sitting in homeroom, and the second bell had already rung. Miss Cavell was straight, no nonsense. We sat in silence while she tallied attendance. This would typically be the time when Paul would slide erasers up his nose to milk an easy laugh out of me before the start of the school day. <laughs> but his chair next to mine was empty. This left me without a science partner for third period, probably without much conversation during lunch. That really bothered me. I mean, Paul was going to leave me hanging all day, and the least he could have done was send along some fair warning. Julie Gable's on the TV, reading the morning announcements, and small pockets of laughter began to surface once someone pointed out the mustard stain smeared across her collar. This girl put mustard on her egg sandwich every single morning, even after being confronted about it by a group of seventh graders. She had guts, no question, but a part of me always wondered if it was really worth the while. If that one squirt of mustard really brightened her morning enough to warrant the harassment it evoked. I was barely even thinking about Julie, to be honest. I was thinking about Paul, and I was thinking about the walk home the night before. Him fighting off tears before just letting them fall. Spouting off about everything he'd ever want to say to Rick Hennessy's face, but never could. The tails of his shirt still stained yellow from what was. By all accounts, a perfectly executed pour from the second floor of the stairwell. Hell, Paul almost laughed off himself when we were still both convinced it was orange juice. Tears didn't come until the odor started to grow stronger. Say what you will about that Rick Hennessy, but the guy is really committed to his work. Paul and I had walked past the hole earlier that week, and I felt him holding his gaze on it for longer than usual. See, there was this long crevice in our town that stretched from the fence behind the furniture store all the way down to Marco Drive. We cut a clear path through the neighborhood, through the woods, and we'd walk alongside it most days, leaping from one side to the other, imitating motorcycle engines as we flew. The hole was the name we designed to the widest, deepest section of the line, isolated somewhere near the midpoint of the woods. We always knew to cool our engines by the time we actually reached the spot. It was the most impressive, pe impressive piece of land amidst all those trees, but he just knew better than a horse around the hole. Paul was never quite himself around the hole. It's not that it made him nervous, it's that it held some strange sort of dominion over him. He'd lie in his belly in the dirt with a tiny flashlight in his hands, calling back effusively about rocks and spiders and garbage he'd catch in small glimpses. But over the last few weeks, he'd been acting differently around it. You could just squeeze yourself down there, and it'd take weeks for them to find you, he said one day, enraptured. They'd be running up and down the whole state just looking for you. Well, yeah, I told him, but you'd end up dead, wouldn't you? Well, of course you would, said Paul. They'd never even know where he went. Sitting there in homeroom with Paul's seat empty next to mine, snippets of film began splicing themselves together. Paul hadn't walked home with me the night before. He'd booked it early on account of the whole Kennedy ordeal. Ms. Cavell asked had anyone seen Paul. No one offered any answer. I pretended not to hear, and she made a mark in her book and we carried on down the line. I could feel my forehead and my chest growing hot, and the fingers on my right hand kept fumbling all over each other. Paul was, for all I knew, laying broken at the bottom of the hole, and had been for hours. And here I was in the same desk as the day before, watching Michelle Landry pick stray hairs from her coat while Miss Cavell organized worksheets at her desk. They were all carrying on as if it were a normal day, 
and none of them had a clue as to what was happening just a few blocks away. And my only friend had given up and hurled himself off to some place cold where he could be alone. I felt sick. I wanted to run alongside that crack in the ground and trace it back to my friend, reach down and pull him out of his hole, march back to his house and find some way of fixing everyone inside there too. I looked over at Michelle Landry again. She was flattening her skirt against her lap. I wondered how she'd feel when she heard the news, what sort of face she'd make. Sure, she hadn't known Paul, Paul that well, but still, the classmate involved in such a sad story? She'd feel something, wouldn't she? Besides, she knew we were each other's only friends. Maybe she would sit and listen to me talk about him, the relationship we had. Asking me to tell her about the good days. Maybe she'd realize how something so special had been sitting right in front of her this whole time, in homeroom of all places, and how she'd almost missed it completely because she'd never taken the time to... That's when the classroom door swung open and in walked Paul, his arms <laughs> overburdened with two tinfoil wrap trays. Sorry, Miss Cavalli, shouted, his voice much louder than the volume on the television. She shushed him and he squirmed an apology. I could feel my eyes beginning to water. I'm sorry I'm late, he explained. Mom made brownies for the class and then drove me because she was afraid to get smushed on the bus. That's fine, said Cavell. Just leave him over there and I'll watch him till, until lunchtime. Paul placed the trays down on a small table next to the old classroom globe which never spun the way it was supposed to. He ambled down the aisle with a big goofy grin on his face and then sidled into the desk next, desk next to mine. Don't worry, Baron, he whispered, handing me a folded napkin. I brought an extra one for you, for now. I took the napkin and unwrapped it, held it in my hands. It was a decent sized brownie, moist, with a bit of powdered sugar <laughs> sprinkled across the top. It's the kind of brownie the kids will clean garages for. I placed it down on the corner of my desk and asked Miss Cavell if I could please see the school nurse. When I got there, I explained I had a stomach ache, and I spent the rest of the day at home in my bed, trying to figure out whatever it was that was going to make me happy. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel, Till Now. It's about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What else is there? <clears throat> the cool September night swelled with expectations and new beginnings. A harvest moon hung low on the horizon. Walking through the Forest Hill streets, I felt I could touch the moon. It was so close and round. It felt like harvest time. I could do this. I was ready. I'd been singing and playing guitar for a while and was sick of waitressing for money. So sick of greasy fries and ketchup and sick of serving people. I was tired of singing alone in dinky pubs where the objective was to cover a two drink minimum. Maybe being in Peter's band would be better. They'd been practicing about a month and Peter couldn't stop going on and on about them last night. He was excited, I was excited. I prepared a few original songs, but musicians know the tricks and I wasn't going to get in by hot-dogging. My plan was to win them over by being natural, being me. As I turned the corner, Eric Clapton's cocaine blared from the detached garage. I grew more nervous with each step as I walked down the narrow concrete drive with a mohawk patch of green grass. I cracked the door open just as the song ended. You're late, said Roy Testimone, the lead singer. All I saw were amps, tools hung on the bed uh, pegboard walls, and Roy in black, black, black. Ramon's t-shirt, jeans, boots, and stick straight long hair. Roy looked Croatian or something. He was with pale skin and chiseled features and clean shaped square jaw and dark brown smoldering eyes. He was striking and dominated the room. Peter nodded and smiled. The drummer and bass player who were fumbling around stopped playing and stared. <coughs> I felt like a girl. Hi, I waved. <laughs> Sit here, Roy patted a bar stool next to him and looked me over from head to toe. What kind of music do you listen to? He said, and don't fucking tell me Stevie Nicks or Zebra like all you Queens girls. <laughs> Darn, and I dream of naming my daughter Rhiannon. <laughs> Clapton, I said. Safe because they just played him. I threw my pocketbook on a filing cabinet and I walked toward Roy. I had on a turtleneck with brown suede coat and boots and tight acid, acid wash jeans and my cool good luck, le good luck leather hat with a silver buckle. Roy was taller, probably 5'10", I guessed, and I stood next to him and then sat on the stool. What song? Layla. 
Of course. Roy lit a cigarette dangling from his mouth, the flame high on the Zippo lighter. He snapped it shut, taking a deep drag and blew a cool stream of gray smoke. Who are the Yardbirds? Led Zeppelin. Who's Pete Townsend? Really, you're kidding me, right? I looked at Peter. Is this guy for real? Roy blew a smoke ring near my face. No, girls don't know shit about real music. He's the Who's genius. Who else? Well, I like the jam, I said, and he smirked, still mad that Paul Weller left punk music behind. And The Clash, and The Smiths, and Elvis Costello, and The Talking Heads, and Bowie, I was going on and on. Yeah, what Bowie song? Geez, just about every one of them, but I guess, God, you know, Heroes, Ziggy Stardust. You like Dylan? Yeah. What song? It depends on my mood. You know, right now I'm thinking Idiot Wind. The drummer <laughs> laughed. Oh, this is heaps of fun. Will you just let her sing and play something? This is ridiculous, Peter said, pulling the fender over his head and setting it on the stand. What Hendrix song did Dylan write? Roy continued, taking another drag. All on the Watchtower. Have you heard of the Ramones? Oh, of course. Dave, Johnny, Dee Dee from Forest Hills, just like us, I said. Were they brothers? I stared at Roy. Man, he was sexy, but so annoying. <laughs> no, they took that name from Paul McCartney. It was the name that he used to check into hotels with. Roy wasn't phased. Named two lefty guitarists other than McCartney and Hendrix. Um, oh, shit. Um, Two songs that start with a chorus first. Um, oh, let's see. Lord, I was born a ramblin' man. Yeah, yeah, ramblin' man. Ramblin' man starts with a chorus. Um, little ditty by Jack and Diane. No, 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 that's like a lead-in. Wait a second, wait. Uh, baby, hold on to me. Whatever will be, will be. Oh, yeah, Eddie Muddy. Eddie Muddy starts with a chorus. Well, we're not a cover band, Roy said blatantly, looking me up and down, and he leaned in close to my face, his brown eyes digging deep, making some kind of deal. I didn't blink. What are you afraid of, he said. Here's the deal. You can't choke on stage, and if you have any fear, it'll show. It'll eat you up, and I don't have time to babysit, so I need to know, what is Amy afraid of? I thought of my mother and her slow, painful death, and how she couldn't dance anymore and she couldn't get out of bed, how she couldn't even hold her arms up to hug us near the end. I slid off the stool, I peeled my jacket off, and I tossed it on the filing cabinet. I took Peter's guitar from the stand and strapped it on. Nothing, I said, facing the four guys. I'm not afraid of anything. three poems for you tonight. The first, I am the best at doctor's offices. <laughs> I know what to wear, the common ground to find with the mom secretary. I always remember a book for the waiting room. I glide with the clipboard. I like the paper crunch under my ass, the beautiful sterility of it all. Pale green charts fuck me with charts, the steel, the shine of it all. Let's catch up, doctor. I am this old now. I do these things for fun. So, shall we? I'm a champion nodder. Of course I agree, doctor. Write it on the pad, doctor. Write a couple, doctor. Three, maybe four, maybe five. Write chaos on them, doctor. I'll always be sick, but the sick can be organized, right, doctor? Mm -hmm. So many Z and X and Y in their names, I can fan them out in my hands like cards each unique like a sickening snowflake. I know the moves the medication makes if I can get from the pharmacy to the car, from the car to the next visit, I just might make it. <laughs> my next poem, My Bicameral Mind. My natural selection lets your transilient bullshit back in time. Now the paleontology of my consciousness is cooked. You're all fibers. I'm all signals. Your skin had a layer of living on it, but I pressed my cheek to it anyway. I can't swim my way out. Nothing but kicking my legs, which are beautifully long and lickably smooth in a lovely shade of nude. At the ends, my pink feet make curvilinear bows in the air. Look at them up there. My spine wants to show you each vertebrate, a model horizontal, but all I can do is make wind and salt. 
And my final poem this evening <clears throat> is called Me Here's Hat. It's innocent how I got the hat. It's chilly and can I borrow it? Me here falls asleep while I'm sewing Lee's jacket on Tom's bed. Collect my things, wearing a hat still. Stand in the middle of the room and look at him. Look up. Notice hat and mirror. Decide to keep it. Blow kiss. Exit. Next day, wear it to work. Safety blanket on crowded subway. None of you can touch me. In stairwell, on my way back down, it occurs to me I was sweating on crowded subway. Brief panic that hat is tainted. Stop on stair. Whip it off quick and stick nose in. All of a sudden, immersed in me here, me here. This is the smell. This is the room. That dangerous, comfy, nerve-wracking, hazy, humid, big eyes, skinny arms, funny bones, funny face, and me here. Trumpets blaring, lights flashing, oceans rising, planets colliding. Me here. All of this by accident. Look up, impressed and stunned. Just accidentally plunged into all of this. Beep. How nice it was. How heartbreaking as well. Nice beats heartbreaking and plunge again. Appreciate it. Recover. Look both ways. Put it back on. Door slam. Thank you. story called Old Man. I wrote it a couple of years ago, but I decided now would be a good time to dust it off and send it into the world again. It was published in this fun little journal called The First Line. They give you the first line and you write the story. The first line for the issue I submitted to was, Roy owned the only drive through funeral business in Maine. <laughs> Roy owned the only drive through funeral business in Maine. Only one was needed. Maine's population never exceeded 10,000, even for the bog ball championships. In fact, the population was dwindling at a steady rate. Maine was a harsh, unforgiving land, blanketed with malaria-ridden swamps in the north and rocky wasteland in the south. Fiery winds blasted unexpectedly from the ocean, melting the skin off anyone unfortunate enough to be caught out or to be outside the plastic-looking dome of the M3 settlement. Pete Wariel, a crazy old vagrant Roy was fond of, said that the winds came after the sea boiled. Pete said he had heard the screams of a hundred thousand lobsters when the seas began to froth and bubble for the first time. <laughs> Roy didn't believe the bit about the lobsters. Lobsters were not even real. They were just something the council made up 20 years ago in a half-hearted effort to promote tourism. They looked like those mutant bugs they just found in Norway, but they were delicious. With a little butter, Pete smacked his toothless gums. It was heavenly. <laughs> right. I'm sure they were great. Roy smoothed out his uniform one last time and straightened his visor before swiping his finger over the scanner on the door. He flicked his cigarette to the sidewalk. Pete, uh, he glanced at Pete, who was leaning feebly on a fallen rusty pole, still mumbling about lobsters. At the end of the pole was a faded sign with a faint outline of an old man's face and the letters KFC. One of his more clever employees had neatly painted around the letters, Courting's Funeral Curators. Are you coming in? Roy lifted a, uh, a lumpy plastic bag that looked like it had been used several times. I had to fight a woman with spikes on her forearms for this last box of bacon -os. Pete gave a happy wheeze and pushed himself up from the pole. He shuffled out after Roy like an old dog in slippers. The tile floor was coated in a thin layer of sawdust that rose in little puffs as they settled on a least decayed and vandalized table shoved into the corner of Roy's establishment. Roy threw the bag on the table. Katie didn't sweep again. God damn, I'd fire her if I knew I wasn't going to have to train someone even stupider and almost as lazy. Pete eagerly tore open the box and dumped equal piles of dry meat on Roy's chipped plastic plates. He pulled a pair of dragged plastic spoons from the bag. You're just angry because you're young. Pete spewed bits of bacon into his scraggly beard. When you get to be my age, you don't care whether the floor is swept or not. Roy ran his hand through his thinning brown hair. He was 35, two years shy of the average life expectancy for white males in the Union. No matter how old I get, I'll want to run a tight business, he said. Pete smacked his gums with relish and suddenly gave Roy a grave look. Roy thought Pete's grave looks were comical because the old man's 
because of the old man's buggy, twitchy eyes. He knew what was coming. It was like clockwork, completely unprovoked and unchanged by the outside. The water yell spiel. You know what I always say, Roy? Roy grinned. That lobsters were delicious? <laughs> Pete waved his withered hand irritably. No! The other thing. Life is cheap. That's what I say. Do ya? When I was a boy, a lobster's life was worth fifteen Union dollars. You might get some biscuits with it, too. There's no lobsters now, but I bet if there were, no one would pay a cent. I bet a child's life ain't even worth fifteen dollars now. Roy Pete pounded the table, sending strips of gray meat everywhere. The door squeaked open, and a teenage girl with stringy dishwater blonde hair and bags under her eyes shuffled in. Katie, clean this mess up, Roy's voice cracked in annoyance. Katie gave a charmless curl of her lip, grunted, and shuffled to the supply closet for a broom. The door had barely squeaked shut when another youth stumbled in. This one had a permanently confused look on his face, like the world was Miss Crabtree's sixth grade math class and life was a particularly challenging quadratic equation. <laughs> Roy pinched the bridge of his nose. Joseph, tuck in your uniform and tell Carl's tree farm to make sure we get more lumber, then warm up the machines. Uh-huh, Joseph said. If the seas ever get if the seas ever get better and you find a nice girl, you should take her to the beach, Pete said, and smiled at Roy. That's prime for a state territory. <laughs> Roy had to snort at Pete's quaint views of courtship. From what he could gather, two mutually attracted people would shack up together. No breeding programs, no genetic match arrangements, nothing. It couldn't be true. The door crashed open and a third employee stormed in. His hair was red and spiky. Unnaturally red, of course. The last redded person died in 2119. He looked confused, too, like he was not sure who or what to be mad at. Thank you. So I'm going to read one poem tonight, um, or an excerpt of a poem. Um, it's from a project that I did this semester, um, writing poems in the form of monologue um, from people who are not me. Um, and this is the first section of this particular character named Rose. Um, and this poem takes place when she's 11. Um, the section is called Hormones. There are three different kinds of tears. The simplest tears are for comfort and ease of vision. Some clear out irritants in our eyes, others clean out irritants in our thoughts. These so-called emotional tears release a chemical compound used by the body to alleviate pain in times of stress. The saline in tears helps conduct electricity, not enough to kill you or even for you to really feel anything at all. Tears are alkaline or for the less scientific, basic, that is, having a low pH, and consequently rather the opposite of acidic, but feel, but against my cheek feel corrosive nonetheless. Crying is a defense mechanism, according to some anthropologists, or biologists, or sociologists. Tears are sometimes involuntary, and can secrete hormones in order to let others know I'm vulnerable. It's often difficult to overcome this fact of my biology. Intense crying leaves tear ducts red and inflamed, and the runny nose can persist several minutes later. The crying is often associated with catharsis and feelings of rejuvenation. It is well substantiated that those who feel shame for crying often feel worse afterward. Thank you, and next is Chris Cassio. <laughs> This is an excerpt from an early section of Anomaly in Progress. And here I was, all this time, thinking that the place was to blame, that it stripped indifferently the souls of its inhabitants as bare as its minds, those enervated streaks of worthless black that scar the earth alongside the highways. But places are just places, green, gray, rusty, sandy, rural, urban, fertile, barren. They don't bring you down or break you. They simply provide new opportunities to watch the people around you peel in unexpected ways. New places and people have a way of reminding you of your own inherent defects, of your own particular place in this world, 
of shoving you back into it with a mercy only Mother Nature could possibly appreciate. You realize that a person is only good enough when he or she is expendable, that anyone who is everything to another is doomed to disappoint, some far more than others. It's because only part of a person is ever really good. The rest, the greater remainder, is never good at all. It's that part that mustn't be unleashed or trusted or even acknowledged until it has caused so much damage that it can no longer be ignored. It's the id, the abuser, the predator, the monster. It waits beneath, like a lion in brush, ready to leap upon us at the instant of idle vulnerability. The truth is that we all live with this animal. We just handle it in different ways. Some of us wake every day in fear, walk along the edges of shoulderless roads, glance uneasily in all directions. Some of us rely on crude self-deception, call it the devil or pretend that it simply doesn't exist. Some of us welcome it, ride upon its back and become devils ourselves. And then some manage to keep the beast at bay. They find some balance, some elusive rationale that allows them to stare full-faced into the fires of the sun and still maintain hope. God, I wish I knew how they do it. Had my family never moved to the mountains, had grandfather died in his own bed in Tampa before ever having come to live in our home, his, leg his legacy of abuse would still have stripped us of our innocence because, in fact, we were never innocent. In fact, it wasn't even his legacy. His father had done it to him, too. And probably his father before him. Mm. Traditions like these have ways of staying hidden, and when they are unearthed, they can only be traced so far as to raise even more questions. I've tried my best to pin it all down, to steady the memories just long enough to get a square look, but I can't. Francis couldn't, and it killed him. And the place is such a wasteland, a black hole of humanity, a part of the world better forgotten than acknowledged. This is the backdrop, the only recollection, the only one my recollection allows, a machine of sorts, a means to press my mind and extract that most vital of realities, that which I've come to know is the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome our final reader, Sarah Zara. Um, this is a piece I wrote for Melissa Banks' memoir class. She, the assignment was something that's ending. Um, it's called My Dog Paperweight. With apologies to J.R. Ackerley. <clears throat> Paperweight is less than a foot long, less than nine pounds, and covered in white fur so soft and fluffy it has a narcoleptic effect. He's part chihuahua, part question mark, and resembles a tiny couch fox. I began cyber stalking him from the computer at Polly Sue's vintage store where I worked. He was featured on the website for Washington Animal Rescue League, where he earned his moniker by sleeping on one of the desks in the office all day. The first time I went in to meet him on my lunch break, I rounded the corner to the small animal's room, and there he was, making eye contact with me. I immediately assumed that he couldn't be my dog. He was way too pretty. My dog didn't have to be so pretty. When I turned in my adoption application, the receptionist informed me that I shouldn't get my hopes up. I was the latest of 30 applications for paperweight. I accepted my slim chances and began to brick and mortar stalk him. Every day on my lunch break, I would go to the shelter, get in his pen, and cuddle with him. I pestered the staff with endless questions about dental care and car safety. <laughs> While I was waiting to hear the verdict, I had a dream that paperweight came and addressed me in a voice not unlike that of Alec Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Sarah, he said, I'd vastly prefer it if you called me Phil. <laughs> After a very anxious couple of weeks, I got the news. He was mine. I picked him up on my lunch break and brought him to Polly Sue's, where he would keep me company each day. On the first day, I settled him into a little bed and sang to him along with our CDs of songs from the 30s and 40s. The stars belong to everyone. The best things in life are free. It actually cost $65 to adopt him. <laughs> but that was for fees and vaccinations, so I felt that the sentiment stood. He was the prince of the store and the prince of the house. I brushed his fur and his teeth twice a day, and I removed his tear stains with a little brush. When we took walks, I naively let him lead. Who was I to tell him what to do? 
Once, he attempted to pounce on a St. Bernard from my shoulder bag. <laughs> the other dog's head was as big as Paperweight's entire body. He's always been smart, but life on the streets left him inclined to routinely try and take out the biggest guy in the yard first. <laughs> they say that smart dogs are harder to train. Although he didn't do everything I asked, he did pick up a couple things. Since he was a chihuahua, I gave him his commands in Spanish. He would sit on siéntate, dance for a treat on baila. But I could never get him to shake hands, no matter how much I said, dame la mano. <laughs> to reflect his proud heritage, I expanded his name to Felipe Paperweight, Señor Guapo Montezuma Zera. <laughs> but we usually called him PW or P-Dub. The guy who washes the sidewalks informed me that his street name is Wait. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Yilla was so taken with Paperweight that she borrowed a photo of him. A year later, she presented me with a stunning portrait she'd painted. We set it up on the sofa to admire it, and Paperweight charged it, looking very confused when he got up close. <laughs> Yilla said it was the best compliment she ever received on her work. <laughs> when my daughter arrived, my poor little prince was dethroned. I never wanted that to happen, but she needed so much more than he did. As a newborn, Madeline was even smaller than Paperweight and, like all human pups, couldn't even hold up her own head. I was sleep-deprived to the verge of insanity, thick with postpartum depression, and physically unable to give him the attention I once did. Five years later, Madeline continues to usurp most of my time. <laughs> but I love that dog-like breathing, and I can't figure out how to let him know. There isn't enough boiled chicken in the world. Paperweight, the world's fluffiest curmudgeon, is on his last legs. I mean this literally. The luxating patella on his right knee is now in the wrong place more often than not, and he falls down with alarming frequency. People tell me I'll know when it's time. I have no idea how that will happen. If he's suffering and doesn't want to live, he can't tell me. I don't want to have him killed just because he's old if he does want to live. He can't see or hear, but he still cuddles occasionally. Sometimes on his walks, he'll break into a run. I keep thinking he has life left in him, and then I hear him moaning in pain, miserable. My veterinarian pal, JD, eyeballed him and informed me that he's blind, deaf, senile, and prone to anxiety. JD says that facing the end is all part of loving an animal, and I know it to be true, but it sucks. <laughs>